again, I just uh, want to praise the Lord that we have Steve Wolberg with us. We, I was tremendously blessed last night by the, the message, and I'm sure that we will be blessed today. Let me tell you a little bit about Steve. He's the director of the White House, or White, the White House. <laughs> Steve, we need you in the White House. <clears throat> He's the d director of the White Horse Media, the author of 30 books. He's an international speaker, and some of those speaking engagements include three appearances on the History Channel. He's had an audience with the Senate as well as the Pentagon. He's an expert in Bible prophecy. He spends a lot of time in the books of Daniel and Revelation. He's married to one wife, Kristen, and he has two wonderful, beautiful children. We've seen pictures of them, Seth and Abigail. He is uh, delivering to us a very relevant word that we all need to hear. Israel has been in the spotlight for, for many times uh, over the past year, especially. And um, we're definitely having an insight into Israel today. We have a following... Following this uh, worship service, we have two more meetings. We highly suggest you stay for our fellowship meal and partake again for the uh, feeding of his word at 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock. So, Brother Steve, would you come please and bless us from the word of God today. Thank you, Pastor. Appreciate that. Yes, it is white horse <laughs> media. <laughs> Not White House. Uh, we live in North Idaho, and I, I think I prefer the mountains to living in Washington, D.C. That's for sure. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be here. Another opportunity to share God's word. I'm excited. Thank you for coming. This is part two of this, this little mini-series that we're doing on Israel in prophecy, Israel issues. We have actually three meetings this afternoon, not two. There's two on the schedule. The next one after lunch is called Seven Years of Tribulation. And we'll tie this in to the topic of Israel. And then we're going to sandwich in between the 2 o'clock meeting and the 4 o'clock meeting what we call a White Horse Report. Not a White House Report, White Horse. Where we're going to, I've got a lot of slides on the screen since I've been here uh, since a year ago to show you a lot of things that are going on with our ministry, how our studio has been built up, and how we're now on coast to coast on a television network called The Walk TV. So I'll be sharing a lot about that this afternoon. And then we're also going to take up an offering. We do take up one offering during the weekend for uh, White Horse Media. We are totally a faith ministry. We trust the Lord to keep us going. It's only by the grace of God that we're here. And so anyway, uh, in your bulletin, there should be an envelope. And if you'd like to later on, you can read our newsletter. We have a newsletter in here that talks about some of the highlights of what's going on. And then after the White uh, Horse Report, we'll take an offering. We'll take a break. And then we'll have the last meeting, which is Israel, Babylon, and Armageddon. That'll be the grand finale. And I understand these are being recorded. Uh, and you have a YouTube site. Is that correct? The church has a YouTube site. Good. So we'll be able to link it, I'm, I assume, and put it on, uh, on our YouTube site as well. And so that as many people as possible can see, can see and hear the program and the message. All right. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to open up to the book of Luke. We are about to embark on an amazing journey. Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. Oh, also, I forgot to mention that we will have, as we normally do, a DVD and book sale tonight after sundown. So and that'll probably go right about the time when we have a light supper after the 4 o'clock meeting. So hopefully you'll be uh, hungry for the lunch and hungry again for a light supper. And then we'll have a lot of our products that we'll be bringing out that we hope will be a blessing to you. Plus, we have a lot of things back there on the table that are free. Lots of CDs. Okay, we are on the screen. Israel and Jesus Christ. This is going to be a very amazing study. Are you ready for a great Bible study? Yes. Are you hungry for God's Word? Yes. 
Okay, well, we're going to get fed this morning. So let's bow our heads and let's pray and ask God to bless us. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this wonderful group of people that have come together to hear your word. Lord, they're not here just to hear me, but to hear you and to think about Jesus Christ. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our Savior. He's the center of everything. He, one day the whole universe is going to worship our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray for your blessing as we open the Bible and as we look at some very deep and powerful uh, issues concerning Jesus that hopefully will touch our hearts and lead us to give our hearts to Christ. Please bless us now, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Israel and Jesus Christ. Hopefully my little clicker will work here. There we go. Now, the more you study the Bible, the more you study both the Old and the New Testament, you will learn a wonderful truth. And that is that Jesus is the center of everything. He's the center of the Bible. He's the center of the Old Testament. He's the center of the New Testament. And we're going to find out that he's also the center of the subject of Israel. When Jesus died on the cross and then rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples and gave them a Bible study. I would have loved to have walked on the road and had Jesus give me a Bible study. Well, let's take a look at Luke chapter 24 and look at verse 27. After he rose from the dead, the Bible tells us that beginning at Moses and all of the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning who? Himself. Right, if you look on the screen here, you'll see this picture. There's a, an eyeball up at the top there looking closely at the Bible. And this verse says that when Jesus rose, he started with Moses. He gave a Bible study for Moses, which is amazing because some people think, well, Jesus has come, so we don't ever need, we don't ever need to read Moses anymore. But that's not what Jesus taught. When he rose from the dead, he gave a Bible study from the book of Moses from the Torah, the books of Moses. He began at Moses and all the prophets. He went down through Old Testament history and he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. When Jesus looked at the Old Testament, he saw prophecies and history about himself. He was the center of prophecy. Now go down to verse 44. Here's an amazing verse. Verse 44 says, He said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written, and what's the first place? In the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms, concerning who? Concerning me. So he's basically saying the same thing. Going back to Moses, the prophets, then he adds the Psalms, and he said these things concern him. Now, notice verse 45. Verse 45 says, Then opened he their understanding. Anybody have a different translation of that first part in verse 45? Then opened he their understanding. Let me see. What, what else do you have? Okay, what do you have? Then he opened their minds. Right, I like that. Then he opened their minds that they might understand the scriptures. Basically what Jesus did was it's kind of like taking a, a little key and putting it in a lock inside of their heads. And then he turned that key and he opened up their minds. He opened up their understanding. And once their minds were opened up to see something new, then what was it that they came to understand? They came to understand that Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms really point to, to who? They point to him. That's right. And this was quite a revelation 
to these disciples. And what we're going to look at this morning is going to be an amazing revelation to us too. I've been studying this for many years. I mentioned last night that I have a Jewish background. I grew up in the Hollywood Hills in a very secular Jewish home, became a Christian at the age of 20. And it was at the age of 20 that the Lord put a key in my head and turned the lock and opened my mind. And then I began to understand the Bible. And step by step, little by little, I began to understand that Jesus is the center of everything. He's the center of everything. Now, we're going to go, what we're going to do now is we're going to go back to the Old Testament and we're going to walk through some Old Testament passages about Israel. And they're definitely about Israel. And then we're going to look at the New Testament and we're going to look at passages about Jesus Christ. And then we're going to compare the Old Testament verses with the New Testament verses and we're going to discover with new eyes that Jesus really is at the center of the subject of Israel as well. So we've got quite a Bible study ahead of us. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis 32. All the way back to the first book of the Bible. Genesis 32. The first time that the word Israel is used in the Bible is in guess what chapter? Genesis 32. Right. Very first time it's ever used. And the context is a wrestling match between a man and a messenger of God. Verse 24. The man's name was Jacob. Jacob was left alone and he prayed. The context of this was that he had just gotten word that Esau, his angry brother, was on the way with 400 men to meet him. Jacob had been gone from home for a long time. He had lied to his father Isaac pretending that he was Esau. His dad was really old. He couldn't see very well. He was getting ready to die, and he wanted to give his blessing upon uh, his firstborn son, who was Esau. And Rebekah, Isaac's wife, wanted that blessing on the younger son, Jacob, because Jacob was more spiritual than Esau was. And so she convinced Jacob to put a, some, some hair on him, some animal hair, because Esau was hairy, Jacob wasn't, and then to go in when uh, Esau was out hunting for some food for his dad, Rebekah convinced Jacob to go in and to impersonate his brother. And so his dad said, uh, who, who are you, my son? And Jacob said, I, I'm Esau, your firstborn son. And Isaac said, well, your, your voice doesn't sound like Esau. You sound like Jacob. Are you really Esau? And Jacob said, yes, dad. It's me, Esau. Feel me. And so he felt him and he felt the hair that he had put on. And so he was convinced. Oh, okay, I guess you really are, Esau. And then he gave him the blessing. The blessing on the firstborn. When Esau finally came back from the hunt and found out what Jacob had done, he was so mad, he said, I'm going to kill my brother. And Rebekah said, son, you got to get out of here. So he fled. He was gone for 20 years. He got married. He had two wives, lots of kids, and now he's on his way back home and he gets word that Esau is on the march. On the march with 400 men and he is scared to death. So Jacob decides to pray. One night he's left alone and the Bible says there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. When Jacob was praying, all of a sudden he felt a hand behind him and he thought, he must have thought, this has got to be Esau. He's fast, and he got here quick. And so he turned around and couldn't really see his uh, attacker or his assailant or who this man was, and so he started fighting and wrestling for his life. And they wrestled all night. Now, this man, as we're about to see, was a messenger of God. And... Uh, I actually believe it was the messenger of God. 
And he could have certainly won the wrestling match quite easily. But he decided to wear him down slowly all night. And there was a reason for that. He was in the process of, of breaking this man down. Does the Lord do that to us today? Does God try to, 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 to break us down and wear us down so that he can get us on our knees so that we look up? He does. He really does. Now Esau, I mean, uh, Jacob thought that this was an enemy. And, we, and when God is doing something in our lives, when he's trying to get us down to our knees, a lot of times we think he, he, this is an enemy. This has got to, this has got to be bad. But many times we don't see with correct eyesight. And it's really the Lord wrestling us down for our own good. <clears throat> and that's, what, that's what's going on. They're wrestling until the breaking of the day. <clears throat> and brothers and sisters, we are almost at the breaking of the day. We're getting close to the final day. A lot of lessons in this section. Verse 25, and when he saw, when the messenger saw that he prevailed not against him, that Jacob was a, a tough young man, you know, he was holding on. And he wasn't, the messenger wasn't accomplishing his mission, his goal. And when he saw that, and he knew the hour was uh, wearing on, and Esau is getting closer, he decided to do an emergency measure. It says he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh went out of joint as he wrestled with him. The messenger then put his finger and he just went and just touched him. Boom. Hit him on the thigh. And as soon as that happened, he knocked his thigh out of joint. And when your thigh is out of joint, where do you go? You go down. That's right. So it was kind of like the messenger was saying, I I'm not wearing you down fast enough. We're running out of time. Esau is on the way. I've got to get you down on your knees quicker. And so he touched him and boom, Jacob was down. And that was amazing because as soon as Jacob felt that touch, knock his, his uh, hip out and he's on his knees, all of a sudden he had an instant transformation. He knew immediately, this is not Esau. Esau is not that powerful. Uh, this is not an enemy. This, this, is, this is a messenger of God sent in answer to my prayers. In answer to my prayers. And so everything changed. And then the messenger said, let me go for the day is breaking. Now don't you think he could have gotten away if he wanted to? Of course, he could have gotten away easily. But th all of this is a divine strategy. He's doing this very uh, methodically and carefully to accomplish a work in this man's life. So he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. And he really didn't want to get away. He wanted to draw Jacob out, draw him out, get him to pray, get him to pray harder. He said, let me go, for the day is breaking. And then Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What a prayer. He said, no, I'm not going to let you go. When, when trouble hits, when crisis hits, do we give up too easily? Or do we hold on? What kind of people do we need to be to get ready for the breaking of the day? Jacob said, I won't let you go. I'm going to hold on no matter what. I heard a story once about an old lady uh, a grandma that at prayer meeting, she said, she said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to heaven even if I have to hold on with my teeth. <laughs> and uh, there was a little boy there, and this was his grandma, and the little boy said, but grandma, you don't have any teeth. <laughs> and the grandma said, well, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold on with my gums. I will hold on no matter what. I will not let go. And that's what Jacob said. I'm not going to let you go in, in, until you bless me. Lord, you've got to bless me. God, you've got to help me. You've just got to help me. I'm in a crisis. 
My brother's coming. I'm in trouble. I've got my family, my two wives, my kids. My life is at stake. I will not let you go until you bless me. Good prayer. And that was exactly the earnestness that God wanted to see. And then the messenger asked him a question. He said, what is your name? Now, don't you think he knew his name? Yes. Of course he did. He knew his name, so why did he ask him? Why did he ask him that question? Well, there's a reason, because in the Bible, names mean things. And the name Jacob literally means crook or deceiver. If you read the Bible, when, uh, when the two of them were born, Esau and Jacob, Esau came out first and Jacob came out holding on to his heel. And they called him Jacob, which means he grasps the heel. Or it also means, it also uh, translates to mean uh, crook or deceiver. How'd you like to name your child deceiver or crook? That's what Jacob meant. And really, that's what he was. He did that. He deceived his dad. He lied to his father. And then he had to leave. So he was a deceiver. He was a crook. And, and that's really the reason why he, he was in this mess in the first place. Because of his own sin. That's why he prayed. That's why his brother was so angry. That's why his brother was on the way to, to get him with 400 men. So the messenger said, what's your name? Who are you? Confess who you are. And then the answer is, he said, Jacob. Probably Jacob, you know, while he's holding on, he puts his head down, and he probably said, I'm Jacob. I'm a crook. I'm a deceiver. I'm a sinner. It's because of my sins that I'm in this mess. Is it possible to get our lives into a mess because of our own sins? Surely, we can cause all kinds of problems for ourselves because of our own sins. So what do we do in that situation? Do we uh, hide our sins? Do we cover up our sins and just try to muscle through it and say, I can do it on my own and I'm not going to, I don't want... You know, anyone to know, and I'm not going to say anything. I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to acknowledge it to God. Is that the right route to take? No. God put Jacob on his knees and then asked him his name. And Jacob acknowledged who he was. He acknowledged, so here he is. He's down on his knees. He's got a broken hip. He's in the crisis of his life. He's desperate. He's holding on. He's acknowledging who he is, but he's not going to let go. He's not going to let go. I tell you, it's so powerful. So powerful. And that was exactly where the Lord wanted him to be. It took him all night to get this man broken, on his knees, clinging to him by faith and acknowledging that he was a sinner. It took him all night, but God finally got him to that place. Has God gotten you to that place? Has God gotten me to that place where we realize we're sinners in need of a Savior? And we're on our knees saying, Lord, yes, I'm a sinner, but I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. You've got to forgive me. You've got to help me in my life. Or I'm going to die. I'm going to die. It may seem like, you know, a horrible place to be, but the reality is that's exactly where Jesus wants us to be. And so when... God's messenger finally got Jacob to where he wanted him. Then look at what he said. Then the messenger said, maybe he was smiling. He looked at Jacob and he said, he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob. He said, 
You're not Jacob anymore. But now I'm going to give you a new name. A new name. And what was that name? Israel. Right. First time the word Israel is used in the Bible. Wow, it gives me shivers. Your name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. Israel. For as a prince, you have had power with God and with men, and you have prevailed. You know what the word Israel means? It means prince of God. Some translations say one who overcomes, one who has power with God and with men. He's a prince. From Jacob to a prince. Have you ever heard the story about uh, the, the frog or the prince that was turned into a frog? And if he got the right kiss, you know, the frog would turn back into the prince. You ever heard that story? It's a, it's a fable, old Esau's fable. Aesop's fable, not Esau, Aesop's. <laughs> and, you know, we're a lot like that because we started out as, as uh, princes. Adam was a prince. Eve was a princess. But then when they sinned, it's kind of like we, we became frogs. <laughs> you know, we, we've got a, a whole new nature. We've just, uh, we're in trouble. So how do we get back to being a prince or a princess of God. Well, the way to get back is to acknowledge that we're frogs. And to say, Lord, you've got to change me. You've got to change me. And that's what Jacob did. And when he acknowledged it, then God changed his name. You are now a prince. And you have had power with God and with men. And you have prevailed. Israel. That's the first time the word is Israel is used in the Bible. Now, don't miss this point. Uh, the first time the word Israel is used in the Bible, it is a deeply spiritual name, isn't it? It's, it's a name given to a man to represent a changed character, a changed life. That's what it means. Powerful. Well, let's keep that in mind. Jacob was now Prince of God. Israel originally was one man. One man. Let me see where my slides go. Israel in the Old Testament. Israel was one man. It was a name that was given to Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Now, as you go down through history, going down to Genesis uh, 33 and onward, you eventually read that Jacob had, we know that he had children, and he and his children eventually migrated into Egypt. Let's go to Exodus. Turn to Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1 says, these are the names of the children of Israel. Now, Israel was that one man. And his children, they came into Egypt Every man in his household came with Jacob. And then it, the Bible lists the names of the 12 sons of Jacob. Verse 5 says that Joseph was already in Egypt. And if you know the story about, you know, Joseph being sold by his brothers, going into Egypt. And, and uh, one thing I want you to remember about Joseph, and I'm going to come back to this, is Joseph was a man who had dreams. Remember that? Joseph was a dreamer. Don't forget that. And Joseph is in Egypt, Israel joins him, and then they began to multiply. And the next couple chapters talks about how the children of Israel grew in Egypt, they ran into trouble with Pharaoh, they were brought into slavery, and finally God sent Moses. He had to break him first. Somebody once said it took Moses the first 40 years of his life to learn that he was somebody as he was growing up in Egypt, in the palace. But then he went out into the wilderness, and this person said it took Moses the second 40 years of his life to learn that he was nobody, tending sheep. And then it took Moses the third 40 years of his life to learn what God could do with a nobody. And that's when he used him 
to bring the people out of Egypt. God broke Moses. He broke Jacob. It's part of the plan. In order for God to rebuild us, we have to be humbled first before we can be rebuilt. It's a basic biblical principle. Well, now it was time for the deliverance. And so God sent Moses to Pharaoh. Pharaoh needed to be broken, but he refused. In verse 22, look at Exodus 4, 22. Exodus 4, 22. 4.22, God told Moses, you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn, and I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me in the wilderness. Now, notice what's happening here. First, Israel was one man, but now... When God said, Israel is my son, let my son go, who's he talking about? He's talking about the whole group of them. So Israel starts out as a man, but then it becomes a people. Right? It becomes a whole people. And notice, what did God call Israel in Egypt? He said, Israel is my son. He called this group, the children of Israel, his own son. And he said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, you've got to let my son go. Let my son go. And Pharaoh refused, and a whole lot of things happening happened. The plagues fell until finally when Pharaoh's own firstborn son died. Then he said, go. Get out. Get out. But he still wasn't completely broken because then he changed his mind. And then he chased the Israelites. He said, what did I do? Let's go get them. Get them back. I want my slaves back. And Pharaoh's stubbornness eventually led him to the bottom of the Red Sea. He refused to be broken. And he lost his life as a result of it. Next text. Psalm 80, verse 8. Psalm 80, verse 8. This verse is talking about the deliverance of Israel out of Egypt. And remember, we've looked at Moses. We're going to look at the prophets. And now we're looking at the Psalms. Remember, Jesus gave a Bible study from Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And in Psalm 80, verse 8, David is writing this, and he said to the Lord, You have brought... And what did he bring out of Egypt? A vine. God said, David said, you've brought a vine out of Egypt and you have cast out the heathen and you planted it. So what is Israel called in this verse? A vine. Right, Israel is God's son and Israel is a vine. Remember that. Now turn to Isaiah chapter 41 verse 8. And then one more Old Testament text. Then we'll go to the New Testament. Isaiah 41, verse 8. Now what does God call Israel? Yes, the, the servant and something else. Verse 8. But thou, Israel... It's very clear. This is talking about Israel. You are my servant. Jacob, whom I have chosen... The seed of who? The seed of Abraham, my friend. So it's very clear in this verse, God is calling Israel the seed of Abraham. Got it? Right? Got it? It's very clear. No, I'm not straining anything. This is exactly what the Bible says. Israel was the seed of Abraham. Now, one more Old Testament text. Turn to Hosea. Hosea is right after Daniel. And look at chapter 11, verse 1. And these may seem like insignificant phrases, but they are going to become... We're going to water them in a few minutes, and they're going to be incredibly powerful. Hosea, chapter 11, verse 1. And I'll put the verse on the screen as well. Hosea 11, 1. The Bible says... When Israel was a child, 
God spoke through the prophets, through the prophet, then I loved him. I loved Israel, and I called my son out of Egypt. See that? Very, very clear. Now, who's this talking about in its context? It's talking about Israel, right? It's very clearly. God says, Israel was a child. I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. I brought my son out of Egypt in the days of Moses, and I planted Israel like a vine in the land of promise. Now, turn to Matthew, chapter 1. First book of the New Testament. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament. Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 says that this book is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Very first line in the New Testament says this book is about Christ. Jesus is the center of the New Testament. He's the center of everything. I heard a story once about a, a, a rich American businessman who went to China and he traveled around and he uh, needed to get across a river. And this man was a rather uh, cocky businessman. He wasn't a very humble man. And he needed, he needed to get across a river and he missed the ferry and so he hired a poor Chinaman who had a little boat. He gave him some money and he said, would you take me across the river? And the poor Chinaman said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. So they're going across the river, and, and the Chinaman is rowing, and the rich man's sitting there in the back of the boat, and he starts quizzing this man. And he says, uh, by the way, do you know the name of the tallest mountain in the world? And the Chinaman said, no, I'm sorry, I don't. Because the, you know, the, the rich man was educated, but the poor Chinaman wasn't. So he said, how about, the, how about the deepest valley in the world? Do you know? Rowing along, no, sorry, I don't. How about the longest river? Do you know the longest river in the world? No. So he asked him all these questions, and the rich man felt pretty, uh, you know, smug about himself that he knew a lot, and this poor guy didn't know much. Well, as they got about halfway across the river, all of a sudden the clouds got dark and it started raining. And the rain started coming down harder and harder and harder and harder. And they were all of a sudden in a, in a storm. And the water started filling up. The boat started filling up with water. And the, uh, the, the poor Chinaman began to start trying to, you know, he had a little bucket and he's trying to get the water out of the boat. And the boat's starting to go down. And he tells the rich man, you better help me or we're going to go down. And then the rich man said, well, huh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm scared. And then the poor Chinaman said, well, let me ask you a question. And then the Chinaman said, he said, do you know how to swim? <laughs> and the, uh, the rich man said, no, I don't. I don't. I'm in trouble. He, he knew the name of the tallest mountain, the deepest valley, and the longest river. But when it got right down to it, he didn't know the most important thing he needed to know that would save his life. And in that instance, it was how to swim. And uh, there's a good lesson for us in that. That there's a lot of things that, you know, things we, there are things we need to know in life. Things are helpful to us in the things that we do, our jobs, our futures, our families. There's lots of things that we need to know. But there is one thing that we need to know that's more important than anything. More important than anything else. Knowing this one thing is what's, is what's going to get us off this planet alive. It's going to get us to heaven. And it's not just really a thing, it's a person. We need to know the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the most important knowledge that we can ever have. Chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem 
Somebody once said the hinge of history is the door of a Bethlehem stable. The hinge of history, the birth of Jesus Christ. Herod was a king in those days, and uh, he heard from the wise men and from the rabbis that Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem, and he was very worried about this. He was threatened. He was the king. He didn't want any other kings to be born in his territory. Herod was a man who never was broken. He was proud all the way to the end. And once he found out that Jesus was born, and he, he told the wise men, go find him. When you find him, come back and uh, tell me so I can worship him too. Was that true? No, that was a lie. Sometimes people say things, but they're not telling the truth. And uh, Herod lied, and the wise men didn't pick up on it. They went down to Bethlehem. They found Jesus. They gave him their gifts, their gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And they, were, and they were going to go back to Herod. But God didn't want them to go back to Herod, so he gave them a dream to go a different way. So they went a different way. And then, in verse 12... Verse 13, when the wise men departed, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Joseph was his earthly father, Jesus' earthly father. Now here's a Joseph, and he's having a dream. We read about another Joseph in the Old Testament, didn't we, who had dreams. And here's a Joseph who's having a dream, and he's warned in a dream. Now look at this carefully. And God said through the angel, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. It's amazing. I was on a radio show recently, talk about this this afternoon, talking about the Sandy Hook nightmare. I'm sure you know about that, about this man that walked into a, this young man that went into a school and did what he did. And uh, that was right before Christmas, too. A few days before Christmas. And I wrote an article on this, and I was interviewed about this just last week, that when uh, Jesus was born, now Jesus wasn't born on December 25, but when he was born, right at the time of his birth, Herod sent soldiers to kill all the babies in Bethlehem. So you have a slaughter of children at the time of the birth of Christ. And that's similar to what happened a few weeks ago. Right before December 25, Christmas time, people are thinking about the birth of Jesus. There's a slaughter of innocent children. And I was so moved by, by this whole thing because I've got kids. I've got a four-year-old, now five. I've got an eight-year-old, and they're in school too. And I could hardly imagine, you know, what would happen if somebody came into that school and just shot my kids dead. And when I was on, and, but there was this girl, this lady, Victoria Soto, one of the teachers in one of the rooms, and she hid her kids in cabinets and in the closet. And when the uh, gunman walked in with his assault rifle, she said, they're in the gym. My kids are in the gym. And then he went, bam. That was the last thing she said. But she saved her kids. Her kids were all saved. And I thought about that. You know, when Jesus was born, you see ultimate love. And Herod sends the soldiers to kill the babies. You see ultimate hatred and evil. You see love and hatred at the same time. Same thing that happened at that school. You see the ultimate sacrifice of a 27-year-old teacher giving her life for her kids. And you see ultimate evil right there. We're in a battle between God and the devil. We're in the battle between love and, and satanic fury. And that battle is uh, hastening to a close. We're in the final days of this conflict. And we need to make the right decision to be on the side of God and on the side of love. Now, keep reading. I've got more to do. I've got to move. 
Um, verse 14 says, Joseph arose. He took the young child and his mother by night, and they went to Egypt. And verse 15 says that they were there in Egypt until the death of Herod. Now look at this. It says that it might, and I'm going to put this verse on the screen. It says that it might be, and what's the next word there? Fulfilled. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt I have called my son. I want, your I want to put a key in your head and I want to turn that lock and I want your minds to open up to something amazing. When I first discovered this, I looked at it, I looked at it again, I looked at it again. I wrote a whole book on this. One of the first books I ever wrote is called Exploding the Israel Deception that uh, deals with misinterpretations in the controversy about Israel. And the whole book really was rooted, it started with this text. Now look at this text. What's going on in this text? Who's coming out of Egypt? Jesus Christ. He's coming out of Egypt. And Matthew is quoting a text that he says is being fulfilled by Jesus coming out of Egypt. Right? That's right. Now, which verse is he quoting? Hosea 11.1. 1. Now, we read Hosea 11.1 1 a little while ago. And Hosea 11.1 1 says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. Now, in its context, in Hosea 11.1, 1, who was it talking about in its original context? It was talking about the nation of Israel coming out of Egypt. Right? It's clear. But now Matthew, in Matthew chapter 2, verse 15, is taking that text. He's doing it. Now some people say, Steve, you can't do that. You can't do that. And my response is, I'm not doing it. Matthew did it. Matthew did it through the Holy Spirit in the first book of the New Testament. He did it. He took that text and he applied it as being fulfilled in who? Jesus in Jesus Christ. That's right. Matthew did that. Now, this is just the beginning, and I've, I'm going to go through these quickly because uh, time is moving. Let me just show you quickly a series of parallels between Israel in the Old Testament and Jesus in the New Testament. All right, let's go through this. Israel in the Old Testament, we read that there was a Joseph who went into Egypt first, right? And Joseph, there's a Joseph in the New Testament who also went into Egypt. First book of the Old Testament, Genesis has a Joseph. First book of the New Testament, Matthew has a Joseph. And we read that Joseph went into Egypt and Joseph had dreams. Read the book of Genesis. He dreamed about his brothers bowing down to him. That's what got him into trouble. That's why they wanted to kill him and they sent him to Egypt. And we read that Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, he also had dreams and he went into Egypt. Interesting. This is just the beginning. And then Israel came out of Egypt in the Exodus, right? And in the New Testament, Jesus Christ comes out of Egypt. And Matthew said, this was fulfilling the scripture. Out of Egypt, I've called my son. Now, um, I'm just going to go through these quickly. When Israel came out of Egypt, they went through the water. Remember that? Pharaoh chased them. Moses put the rod down. The sea parted, and Israel went through the sea. Now, I'm just going to quote this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. Um, Paul said that Israel was baptized in the sea by Moses. So that was like Israel's baptism. They went through the water, and that was like their baptism. Read that, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. 
That's exactly what Paul says. Now, after Jesus came out of Egypt, he also was baptized. In Matthew chapter 3, he comes out of Egypt in chapter 2, and in Matthew chapter 3, he's baptized. And John, the Baptist, says, I can't baptize you. I'm not worthy. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, no, you must baptize me because this is what we have to do to fulfill all righteousness. It has to happen. Now, Israel, now watch this. When Israel, after she went through the Red Sea, how many years did she end up wandering in the wilderness? Forty. Forty years. And in Matthew chapter 4, right after Jesus was baptized and God called him my son, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness for how many days? Forty. Exactly. Why 40? Why not 30? Well, there's a reason for this. Now, listen to this. When Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted by the devil, he tempted him three times. And every time Jesus was tempted by Satan, he resisted temptation by quoting a Bible verse, quoting a text. It is written. It is written. It is written, it is written. Three verses. Now, don't miss this. Those three verses that Jesus Christ quoted all came from one Old Testament book. Anybody want to guess what book? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. That's right. And Deuteronomy is the book that God gave Israel when Israel was in the wilderness. That's right. And Jesus was quoting the scriptures that God had given Israel in the wilderness. The reason why she wandered in the wilderness for 40 years was because of unbelief. Because she failed. So she, she didn't trust him. So she had to go back into the wilderness for 40 years. And what's happening is Jesus Christ is repeating Israel's history. But instead of failing, he's conquering. Instead of unbelief, he has faith. He's conquering point by point by point exactly where Israel failed. In the Old Testament, when God brought Israel out of Egypt, he brought her to Mount Sinai and made a covenant with the 12 tribes of Israel. At the end of Jesus' life, he met with 12 apostles and made a new covenant in an upper room the night before he died. In the Old Testament, Israel was called a vine. In John chapter 15, verse 1, Jesus said, I am the true, what? That's right, I'm the true vine. The true vine is me, Jesus said. In Isaiah 41, verse 8, we already read, Israel is called the seed of Abraham. Now turn to Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Galatians 3, verse 16. Look at this verse. This is so amazing. I'm going to push my button here and bring up my eyeball on the screen. And we're going to take a look at this verse. Galatians 3.16, Paul wrote, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. God made promises in the Old Testament to Abraham and to his seed. And who was the seed of Abraham in the Old Testament? Israel. We read that in Isaiah 41 verse 8. Now look at this. Paul said... He saith not, and to seeds, see that s on the end there? If, uh, I, I used to live in California, and often we would go into the, into the desert or into the mountains, and, uh, and if, if I ever heard a s, <laughs> then you need to, you know, you need to listen up. 
stay out of the way, get out of the way. If, if, a, if a comes out of a bush, don't go near that bush. That is important. And Paul is making a whole point based on the in the Old Testament, the promises were made to Abraham and his seed. Not seeds. Seed. Singular. He does not say seeds as of many, but as of one, Paul said. As of one. One seed. God made promises to Abraham and one seed. That's what Paul's saying. And then what does he say? And that seed is who? That seed, Paul says, is Christ. Now, somebody says, you can't do that, Steve. You can't do that. I see where you're going with this. You can't do that. And my response is, I didn't write this. Paul did. Amen. Just like Matthew. Matthew wrote Matthew, not Steve Wahlberg. And Paul wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he's basically saying that Jesus Christ is the seed of Abraham. That's what he's saying. Now remember, in the Old Testament, Israel started out as a deeply spiritual name in Genesis 32, right? And it was a name given to how many people? One. One person. Just one. And what Paul is doing here in Galatians 3.16, he's taking that seed of Abraham and he's applying it to one person. And that one person, he says, is Jesus Christ. How many ways are there to heaven? One. Now, some people might think, you know, boy, that's sure, you sure are being uh, narrow-minded and dogmatic. I thought all roads lead to heaven. No, all roads don't lead to heaven. There's only one road that leads to heaven. And that one road is a person. And that one person is Jesus Christ. And if, if I'm going to get to heaven, if you're going to get to heaven, we're going to get there through one person. Through Jesus. He's it. He's the only way. And he... You know, Israel went through her whole history and she failed over and over and over and over and over again. How about your history? How about mine? <laughs> I look at my history. If you look at your history, don't you see that you failed over and over and over and over again? But you know what? There's one person, only one, only one who never failed. Never. He doesn't have a checkered history. He came out of Egypt. He was in the wilderness. He conquered step by step by step by step. When Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. It is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Jesus thought about you, he thought about me, he thought about Israel, he thought about all the people that have sinned, all the people that have failed. And he said, I will not fail. Amen. I will conquer. Satan, get out. Be gone. You ever heard the song by Mick Jagger, Sympathy for the Devil? Jesus Christ had no sympathy for the devil. Not an ounce. And he resisted step by step by step. And he did it for you. I was listening to a song the other day about how, how he climbed up that final hill to the cross and he set his face like a flint and he said, I will keep going. I will accomplish my mission. I will die for the sins of the world. And the song said, as I watched him struggle up that hill, it says, why? Why did he do it? He did it for you. He did it for me. I tell you, He's my hero. Thank you, Lord. I don't have, my hero's not Batman. My hero's not Superman. My hero's not any ninjas. You know, those are not my heroes. My hero is my Lord, Jesus Christ. 
He, he did it where I failed. He's the one. He's your righteousness. He's your savior. He's your prince of peace. All your failures can be covered by his righteousness. If you choose, like Jacob, to acknowledge that you're a sinner and that you have no hope in yourself and you get down on your knees and you allow God to break you and you say, Lord, I won't let you go until you bless me. You are my only hope. Jesus will say, your name is no more Jacob. Your name is Israel. And he will take 33 years of his perfect living and he will, he will replace your history with his own. So where all you, the places you failed, he'll put all the places that he conquered right on top of it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus is the one. He is my righteousness. He is my savior. He can cover me and he can cover you with his victory so that when God looks at you and looks at your record, he doesn't see all your failures. He sees his own son's victory in your behalf. That's called righteousness by faith. It's wonderful. Now, a little bit more to do before we're done. Go down to verse 29. Remember, Israel in the Old Testament started out as one man. But then, it, what did it become? A people, right? It was one man, and then it was a people. Is the same true in the New Testament? Is Israel one man... Jesus Christ and the people that are in Christ. What do you think? Does that sound like a good uh, possibility? Well, let's find out. Let's find out. Gen uh, Galatians 3.29. I read this last night. Verse 28 says, There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ. Jesus. And if you be Christ's, if you belong to Jesus, if you give him, him your life, like Jacob, if you say, Lord, I'm a sinner, I'm helpless, I'm a frog, make me a prince. Forgive my sins. I'm going to hold on to you and trust you no matter what. I'm trusting you, Lord, not me. If you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed? And you are heirs according to the promise. Jesus will then cover your past, cover your sins, and he'll take you and he'll put you in to the seed. So the seed is not just Jesus, but it's those who are in him. Those who are his children. One more verse in Galatians, chapter 6. Verses 14, 15, and 16. We read this last night. Paul wrote, God forbid that I should glory. Self-glory. Pharaoh gloried in himself. He lost his soul. Herod gloried in himself. He died a miserable death. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, in Jesus, neither circumcision, which applies to Jews, avails anything, nor uncircumcision, which applies to Gentiles, but a new creation or a new creature. How many of your Bibles say new creature? How many of your Bibles say new creation? Okay, that's, it means that you've been made new. Just like Jacob, when he humbled himself, the angel, the messenger said, you're, you're not Jacob anymore. Now you're Israel. You've been changed by grace. You're right where I want you. And I can save you. I can cover you. I can change you. I can change you. A new creature. Verse 16, as many as walk according to this rule, this doctrine, this teaching, this standard, peace be on them and mercy 
and upon the Israel of what? The Israel of God. Right. God's Israel. God has an Israel, doesn't he? Jacob's name was changed to Israel by God. God changed his name. He was an Israel of God because the angel said, as a prince, you have struggled with God and with men, and you have prevailed. You've overcome. How do you overcome? By going down. You overcome by going down. Those who spend time on their knees can stand. Those who want to go to heaven must go low to the foot of the cross. The route up is down. And when we go down, the Lord will lift us up. That is the Bible truth. And the Israel of God is number one, Jesus Christ. He is the Israel of God. He's the prince. He's the prince of peace. Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms are centered in him. He opened their minds. He put a key in. He turned the, the lock. And he opened their minds so they could understand the Bible, that Jesus is the center of everything. Wow. He's the Israel of God. The primary Israel of God is him and those who believe in him, Jews, and Gentiles, Jews and Gentiles, together become the seed of Abraham in Jesus Christ, our Savior. That is solid Bible truth. Now, before we finish, let me give you another quick uh, tease. Revelation 16, 16 says he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. There's going to be a final battle that's coming down the pike, and we're right at the edge of it. A final conflict. What happened at that elementary school is a window into a war that we are in. We are all in a war. And we've talked about last night that there's an Israel of the flesh, and there's an Israel of God, right? Two Israels. 1 Corinthians 10.18 talks about Israel of the flesh. Galatians 6.16 6, talks about the Israel of God. I believe that Israel is going to be at the center of the battle of Armageddon. I believe that. But the question is, the question is, which Israel is going to be at the center of the battle of Armageddon? Last text before we pray. Revelation 17, verse 14. Armageddon's mentioned in chapter 16. Chapter 17, verse 14, describes the war. It talks about in verse 13 about the beast and the horns. Verse 13 says they have one mind. They give their power and their strength to the beast. And there will be a battle, a final battle. And who is the battle against? The final battle of Armageddon the final struggle of the ages, who is the war against, according to your Bible? Verse 14 says, these shall make war with who? With the Lamb. That's right, with Jesus. And, and he's Israel. Israel is at the center. And they're all going to gather together to make war on Jesus Christ. But it's not just Jesus Christ. It says that the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Hallelujah. Jesus cannot be beaten. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Jesus cannot lose. We're on the winning team if we're with him. He won 2,000 years ago. He conquered for you. Our hero made it spotless to the cross and he rose from the dead and he went to heaven 
and he's going to come back. He's going to come back. Hallelujah. And the Bible says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And look at that. And they that are with him. They are also the center of the war. They that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. God is calling you. And God is calling me to be with Jesus in these final days. Do you hear the call? Do you hear the call in your heart? He's calling us and he's chosen us. He's chosen you to be on his side. He's chosen me. He's chosen you to be on his side. And the last part of the verse says, we not only need to be called, and we not only need to be chosen, but what else do we need to be? We need to be faithful. That's right. Faithful to our Lord, who gave everything for us. Uh, I talked to my kids this morning. I think I mentioned last night that uh, Seth went snowboarding yesterday. Second snowboarding lesson. And uh, first time he didn't go down the big lift because he didn't know what to do. He'd just probably roll all the way down. And, but he wanted to go down that lift on his second lesson. And the lesson was yesterday and I was on my way here. And so I was hoping and I, we prayed <laughs> for my eight-year-old son that, he, uh, he, that if he went on the lift and went down the slope on his snowboard, that he wouldn't die. <laughs> that he'd make it, because I knew he wanted to do it. And so uh, this morning when I called, my wife and Seth and Abby were there in the background. Uh, Abby got on the phone and she said, Daddy, she said, Seth isn't dead. <laughs> <laughs> Seth isn't dead. <laughs> and I thought, praise the Lord. He made it. Well, we're about to pray. And uh, we're in a final, we're in a war, aren't we? And when the dust settles and it's all over and Jesus comes to deliver his people, who is going to survive alive in the final war? Will all the angels say about you, praise God, you're alive? I, I've already made my decision. <laughs> Abby said the other day, she said, Daddy, I've made my decision. I'm going to follow Jesus. And I hope you'll make the same decision right now. Jesus loves you. He's the one. <laughs> He's everything. He's got you on his heart. He overcame where you failed. He can cover you with his righteousness. He can change your life, give you a new name, and get you ready for heaven. And that's what really the topic of Israel, when we really understand it, is all about. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord Jesus, what a powerful Bible study we've had. And I pray for every person here, and I pray for myself, help us to choose you. Lord, we all have sinned like Jacob, we all have problems. Some of us are very old, and some of us has, have bodies that are hardly able to even get to church. But Lord, you love us anyway, and someday soon you're going to come back again, and you're going to give us new bodies. You're going to take us alive to heaven, where we can live with you, our hero, forever and ever and ever. Lord, may that day come soon. Help us all to be called and chosen and faithful in these last days, trusting you all the way and not in ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.